Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you to Town Hall for sponsoring this evening's program, and, and a happy Black Lives Matter at School Week to everybody. I'm honored to be with you all this evening and have the opportunity to introduce my dear friend Diane Ravitch and help celebrate who, her brand new book, Slaying Goliath, The Passionate Resistance to Privatization and the Fight to Save America's Public Schools. And I promise that I'm not just saying that because she has a section in the book about Garfield High School and our resistance to the, to the MAP test. But we are all very fortunate to have Diane with us here today because the last time I shared a stage with her was at an event in New Mexico. And at that event, she promised the audience that she was no longer going to tour again and speak out uh, publicly. So uh, thankfully, she goes back on her word sometimes. It's not the only time she's ever changed her mind about anything. <laughs> I get to poke fun at her. Uh, but Diane is a research professor of education at New York University, a historian of education. She's the founder and president of the Network for Public Education. And she's many things to many people, uh, but she means something very specific to me. And I hope with this brief introduction to highlight some of the key contributions she's made to the struggle to defend and transform public education, but also say a word about how she's helped uh, change my life. And first I want to say it is fortuitous that we have one of the leading warriors against corporate education re reform with us here today during Black Lives Matter at School Week because I want to submit to you all today that every single one of the pillars of the corporate education reform platform has been sold to us as the, quote, new civil rights movement, and in fact... Every single one of them have proven to further entrench institutional racism and inequality in our society. And I think these pillars are a zealous de uh, devotion to standardized testing, attacking teachers' unions, privatizing education with vouchers and charters, and closing schools in black and brown neighborhoods. And Diane Ravitch has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the billionaires, using her platform to fight against every one of those policies. But some of you might know that she hasn't always been so seditious. From 91 to 93, she was the Assistant Secretary of Education under the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. She uh, also helped to lead efforts in, in support of uh, the now defunct No Child Left Behind Act. And actually, when I began teaching in 2001, I began in, in Washington, D.C., and Diane and I were actually on opposite sides of the barricades. But before you get up in arms about her past, know that I really don't know anyone who's worked more tirelessly to expose the lies of what she calls the Billionaire's Boys Club in their efforts to privatize public education and Really, who among us can say we haven't made a mistake? Uh, and I myself should reveal that I uh, fell for the, the corporate education reform uh, organization, Teach for America, and uh, was sucked into to, to that path to education before realizing that I might need more than five weeks of training So I hope you already bought her book, but if uh, you should read all of her books, Reign of Error, The Hoax of, Privatiza of the Privatization Movement and the Danger to America's Public Schools in 2014, and you should read The Death and Life of the Great American School System, How Testing and Choice are Undermining Education, right? And these books made an extraordinary contribution to the national debate around education, but her work means something really personal to me, and I just want to end my introductory remarks by, by saying that I was in a really important struggle in 2013 when 
all the teachers at Garfield High School voted unanimously to refuse to give the Measures of Academic Progress test. Thank you. Right? And, you know, the MAP test uh, was a mandated test, and the superintendent of public schools at the time told the testing subject teachers that they would face a 10-day suspension without pay for refusing to give these tests. And it was Diane Ravitch who came to our aid. She began blogging about our, our boycott of the test, and she helped to get people to sign on to a letter of support for our rebellion. And with her support and others, not only did the superintendent not suspend any of the rebellious teachers that year, but he actually got rid of the MAP test altogether for Seattle's high schools. So getting recognition from Diane for our struggle was life-changing for me. Her, boy, her amplification of, of our boycott helped to give me a voice and a platform to, to reach people with the message that we were organizing at Garfield. And then she wrote the introduction to my book, More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing, which helped me reach so many more people with the way these tests are destroying the learning experience for our kids. And for all that, I want to give my deepest gratitude and respect to Diane and say thank you. And I want to just end by saying that people always say it will be the youth who change the world. And, and there's some truth to that. I've seen my students do some amazing things. But Diane Ravitch proves Pablo Picasso right when he said, youth has no age. So help me r welcome Diane Ravitch to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's such a pleasure to be back in town hall. And I can barely recognize it because I was here, I think, 10 years ago, and it was way different. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, I wanted to say that I'm glad I have a voice because over the weekend I had a very serious case of the flu, and I'm here, and I'm able to speak, and I'm very grateful. <laughs> and I don't appreciate your weather, but it's not your fault. <laughs> um, when I asked Jesse if he would introduce me, I forgot that I told him in Santa Fe that I never planned to speak again. <laughs> but it was true. I thought that I was finished. I said the last thing I had to say in Reign of Error. And then something happened. And that was, two, it was last, I guess it was February of 2018, February 22nd, I read about the West Virginia, Virginia teacher strike. And as I watched these teachers in West Virginia walk out across the state, closing down every school in the state, 50 districts, they call their movement 50 strong, and it's against the law to go on strike in West Virginia. But every superintendent in the state closed every school in the state, so technically they were not on strike. And no one could be fired. And they descended on the state capitol. And on February 22nd, I'm going to be in Charleston, West Virginia, to celebrate with them the two-year two anniversary. anniversary of their creating this movement. And when they created this movement, I began to see something incredible happening. I realized that what they had done and the wave that they set off, the wave that they created that rolled on to Oklahoma, to Arizona, to Colorado, uh, to Los Angeles, to Oakland, to districts across the country, and I don't think that that wave is ended. I think that Red for Ed lives and will continue uh, wherever there are teachers who are underpaid, which is almost everywhere in America. Mm -hmm. That made me realize that what had happened was that they had changed the national narrative. And what I had been writing about, first in the books that uh, Jesse mentioned, the death and life of the great American school system, and then reign of error, was that teachers were being unfairly blamed for social problems that were not of their causing and beyond their control. 
and that there was this narrative that had grown up and it was being amplified by the Billionaire Boys Club. And, and at the time I wrote uh, Death and Life, I only had three members in the club. Bill Gates, the Walton family, and Eli Broad. <laughs> Little did I know. In this new book, I have a chapter devoted to the disruptors, who is Goliath. There are dozens of people like them. They're not, not all as rich as the Walton family, but it's incredible how many corporations, how many billionaires are part of this movement to privatize public education, to attack public schools, to attack the teaching profession, to deprofessionalize it, to replace professional teachers with inexperienced and idealistic young people, and to monetize public education. They see this as this vast flow of government money in which uh, there should be people making a profit. And at the time, I realized there were conferences. I used to, because I had been on all the right-wing uh, mailing lists and email lists, I would get invitations to conferences on how to make a profit from public education. And I was a guest of all of the hedge fund managers and equity investors who were trying to get in on the money flow. And so I wrote about this uh, attack, this assault on the schools, and I can't say that I was hopeless, but I didn't see where it was going to end. And in the spring of 2018, I began to see a new narrative emerging. And the new, new narrative was teachers are underpaid. There are teachers who are working second jobs, third jobs, fourth jobs. There are teachers saying, uh, I sell my, my blood plasma to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And one of the most dramatic changes occurred when I saw the cover, covers of Time Magazine. Now, Time Magazine in 2008 had done a cover story on Michelle Rhee in Washington, D.C., and there was a photograph of her with a broom, and it said, uh, Michelle Rhee knows how to fix America's schools. And she stood there sternly with a broom, and she planned to sweep out all the riffraff that was teaching in Washington, D.C. That was the implication. And she came there to fire people. And then they had a story about a lawsuit in California called the Vergara case in which a Silicon Valley multimillionaire or billionaire, I'm not sure which, funded a lawsuit to take away tenure and seniority and due process rights from teachers. And the cover said, it had a photograph of four apples and one of them was rotten. And it said, uh, teachers are rotten apples. One out of four of them, it implied by the, by the illustration, was a rotten apple. And the wording on the cover said, this Silicon Valley investor has figured out how to fix American education, which is take away tenure rights from teachers, which is insane. And fortunately, the case lost. It was thrown out. It was brought in other uh, states. It was also thrown out in other states. And Newsweek magazine uh, followed with its own cover stories. Uh, one of them had a picture of a blackboard and it said again and again, we must fire bad teachers, we must fire bad teachers. We, like the teachers were the problem. We have to get rid of all these bad teachers. So this was the narrative. And suddenly, with the Red Fred movement and the teacher strikes, Time Magazine comes out in one week with three alternate covers. And I don't know how you decided which cover you ended up with, but one cover was, uh, I said, uh, I teach for X dollars a week. My child and I share a bed and a one-bedroom apartment. I can't afford to pay for a larger apartment. I am a teacher in America. Second cover and a third cover, all three published at the same time, telling a story of an underpaid teacher who couldn't meet basic needs. And the end line was, I am a teacher in America. And then we began hearing from different think tanks about the underinvestment in our schools, about the capital needs that were not met about the fact that most of our, our schools had stopped spending on, they had never reinvested after the recession of 2008. And they were today, and at that time, 2018, 2019, spending the same that they had, had been spending 10 years earlier. There had been no increase, although the number of students had increased. And the narrative changed from bad teacher failing schools to what are we going to do to help our schools? And so what struck me in that moment was uh, I've been collecting stories about resistance over the years. There is a thread here. 
And so I put it all together and realized that there's a way to win this battle. And the first is to say, and I demonstrate in the, in the book, that nothing that's been promoted by people like Bill Gates, Eli Broad, the Walton family, Betsy DeVos, uh, Reed Hastings, there's a long list of billionaires. Nothing they've done has worked. Uh, nothing in Race to the Top worked. Nothing in No Child Left Behind worked. It all failed. Charter schools do not do better than public schools. Charter schools get the same results if they have the same kids. Sometimes they get far worse results. The absolute worst schools in the state of Ohio and the state of Nevada, for example, and there are probably many more, uh, are, the, are, the, are the charter schools. And I've often asked the question, well, now once you've moved the kids into the charter schools, who will save the children from failing charter schools? But what happens is that the legislatures in these states like Ohio and like Florida are so deeply committed uh, monetarily to the people who fund charters and vouchers that they never go backwards. They just, even though the charters are failing, they want more of them. And so in Ohio, for example, where they've had vouchers now for many years, the only study in, of vouchers in Ohio said that vouchers actually cause kids to go backwards. They lose ground. And so Ohio has just enacted another voucher program. They've just expanded vouchers to cover two-thirds of the state. And it's insane. The state of Florida spends a billion dollars a year on vouchers for religious schools, two billion dollars a year on, on charters, and meanwhile it's public schools where 80% of the kids are, are desperately underfunded. So there's a lot of pushing back that needs to be done, and I don't argue that Goliath has been defeated by David. I argue in this book that Goliath is brain dead. Because nothing that Goliath has proposed, whether it's charters, vouchers, measuring teachers by the test scores of their students, parent triggers, uh, a long list of other uh, so-called remedies, none of it has worked anywhere. And I go through the various failures, and then I chronicle the resistors. And one of my stories is about Garfield High School, where the teachers of Garfield got together and unanimously decided not to give the map test. <laughs> And one of my favorite lines in the book is when the superintendent is coming in to talk to the teachers and to try to persuade them to give the test. And Jesse Garfield says to him, you know, if you switch over to our side, when CNN comes in tomorrow, we can make you famous. <laughs> Guilty. I thought that was a great line. Uh, but among the stories that I particularly enjoy... And I have to say, that this is not just about stories, but the bottom line here is that people who have resisted have stopped this giant in its track. And one example is a, a friend of mine in New York, Lainey Hampson. Uh, got, is, <laughs> Lainey got very angry about invasions of student data privacy. And she joined with her friend Rachel Sticklin in Colorado because Bill Gates created something called Endloom. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but the idea was that uh, the Gates Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation put up $100 million to take student data, 400 data points for every child, put it into a software package managed by a company owned by Rupert Murdoch, put it in a cloud overseen by Amazon, and what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> There were no guarantees that student privacy would be maintained. And meanwhile, if it were exposed, there would be this tremendous invasion of privacy. So Lainey and her friend Rachel contacted parents in every district and in every state that had agreed to cooperate with Enbloom. And the last state to pull out of Enbloom was New York State. And when New York State pulled out, Enbloom collapsed. And there was no money on, our, on, on Lainey and, and Rachel's side. Two people, two parents, energized parents across the country, and they brought down Bill Gates and the Carnegie Corporation. Yeah. Another story that I particularly loved was the story of G2 Brown in Chicago. Uh, G2 Brown was a civil rights leader. He leads a group called the Journey for Justice. He's a 
huge man and very impressive and brilliant. And he was very upset that the last open enrollment public high school in Bronzeville was going to be closed. It was called the Walter H. Diet High School. And it has a long and storied history. And Rahm Emanuel, who was in charge of the schools, said it would be closed. And so G2 and his friends began to shadow Rahm Emanuel with big signs saying, save diet. Don't close diet. Rahm Emanuel ignored them. And then they decided on a new tactic. They tried all the usual protest tactics. None of them worked. They opened up their plastic lawn chairs on the campus of Diet High School, and they announced that they were on hunger strike. And the first week, no one paid attention. And the second week, a few local newspapers noticed. And the third week, they began to get national publicity. On the 34th day of their hunger strike, Rahm Emanuel capitulated. And he said, I'm putting $15 million into the renovation of the Walter H. Diet High School for the Arts. And it was reopened a year later as an elegant new building. And he was brought down by 12 people sitting in plastic lawn chairs. No money. And I have lots of stories like that. What's exciting is when you see powerful people who don't want to listen, <clears throat> but who are nonetheless brought down by persistence and by people who know that they are fighting for the right. And the great power of this resistance movement, in my view, is that no one pays us to do it. And I've often had this vision that if the, I don't call it the reform movement, I call it the disruption movement, I mean, Jesse and I will talk about that in a minute. But if these people who lead the movement, Betsy DeVos and uh, her crowd, Bill Gates and the rest of them, if they were to call a convention and, let's say, hire out the biggest hall in Seattle or New York or wh wherever, and there was only one rule about who could attend, only people who are not paid to do the work can attend. That would exclude most of the people who are involved in these organizations. So if they are relying only on volunteers, it would only be themselves that would be an empty hall. Whereas the people who are fighting to save public education are in the millions. We work without money, and because we work without money, we work with passion and dedication, and when we have setbacks, we still keep fighting, and they don't understand it. And that's why I think that in the end, when you're doing the right thing, when you're fighting for the public good, and I believe in public education because we are up against a combine these days that wants to privatize everything. They want to privatize space. They want to privatize Social Security. They want to privatize Medicare. They want to pri privatize public education. And we have to draw the line and say, no, you can't do this. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm still speaking. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you went back on the road. Thank you for going back on that, <laughs> that promise. Uh, and it's great to have you here this week, Black Lives Matter at School Week. And we're trying to change the schools too. We have a little different agenda than, than the disruptors, as you call them, in, in this book. And uh, what, what is the, why do you call them disruptors versus reformers? Well, in the book, I explain that, to me, reform is a very noble term, uh, and that as someone who studied the history of American education, reformers were always trying to make schools better. Uh, they wanted more resources for schools. They wanted um, to have teachers who were better prepared. They wanted better curriculum, better this, better that. Um, they wanted schools to be integrated. They wanted equal educational opportunity. Now, that's my goal, the goal of reform, and, it, and I'll be the first to admit it has never been achieved, but it's our goal. Mm -hmm. And so I can't take the term reform and apply it to people who want to destroy and disrupt public education. And I call them disruptors because that's what they're best at. Uh, when I think about the last 20 years, starting with No Child Left Behind and then uh, Race to the Top, all these mandates come out of Washington and no one has a choice. They're just told, you have to give a test to every child, third through eighth grade, uh, every year, 
and there's no high-performing nation in the world that does that. Yeah. And this, t the te I, there's a lot in the book about the testing. And the testing is essentially discriminatory, uh, right. as you well know, uh, and right. has a long history of, of being discriminatory. Uh, it was rooted originally in the eugenics movement in the right. 19-teens and 1920s. And the nature of standardized tests is that it's normed on a bell curve. And the bell curve never closes by design. So when people say, um, you know, if you do what I tell you, you'll close the achievement gap, they're not, they either don't know or they're lying because the achievement gap is built into the, into the bell curve and it's built into standardized testing. So they're saying the bell curve is somehow going to miraculously close. It doesn't and it never will. There will always be a bottom half, there will always be a top half. The top half will always be dominated by kids from affluent upper middle class families and the bottom half will always be dominated by children who have less of everything. And so it's designed to discriminate the nature of, of standardized testing is this one will be first and this one, will, you know, it'll go from the least to the most, and that's the nature of the test. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was just going to uh, say that Ibram X. Kendi, who just wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamp from the Beginning, I mean, he, he says standardized tests have become the most effective racist weapon ever de devised to objectively degrade black minds and legally exclude their bodies. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about the way they, these tests have been used uh, to further entrench institutional racism. Uh, it's the nature of the test that they, um, they lead the person being tested to believe that this is science. Mm -hmm. And so science says that you are at the bottom. And at this year, you fail this year, you fail next year, you fail every year, and at some point you internalize the sense that you're no good mm -hmm. because this objective test says you're no good. You're always in the bottom 10%, you're always in the bottom 20%, and somehow you can't, someone is always going to be in the bottom 20% by definition. And you can, will never have equity if you use a standardized test as the, the measure by which you uh, grade people. And what the, the standardized test does essentially is to give privilege to the privileged. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was my experience in school. I knew from the time I was in third grade when I first sat down at my parent-teacher conference, and there was the, me, the line that showed the median and my little dot way at the bottom. I knew I wasn't smart from that day until about halfway through college when I finally realized there were other metrics, other ways to think about intelligence. Um, so well, that, th this is the thing with schooling, is that you, we should have a schooling, a school system uh, or a school in which there are many ways to recognize creativity, originality, that's right. excellence. That's right. That's um, right. Persistence. There are all kinds of ways to be good at things. And uh, I remember it, I had a, there's a guy in Seattle who had been part of this disruptor movement. And I did a podcast with him. Nick Hanauer, he's a billionaire, or he says he's not quite a billionaire. He may be a 900 millionaire. <laughs> um, but I said to him, you know, I got high scores when I was in school, and so I thought I was really good. And then I realized getting high scores didn't make me better than anybody else. I was just lucky I had that kind of, you know, I had a test-taking intelligence. Good for me. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't make me better. I'm no better than the next person. So one of the epigrams that I used at the beginning of my book uh, is something I wanted to read. Yeah. Two, two of them, actually. This one comes from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said in 1928, I believe in standardizing automobiles. I do not believe in standardizing human beings. Standardization is a great peril which threatens American culture. Yes. And then this is from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who said in the spring before he was assassinated, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics to, and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. And I knew that people would say to me, that sounds kind of anti-intellectual and anti-educational. Why did you put that in there? And I said, I put that in there because I wanted to say 
that every human being is equal to every human being, every other human being. Mm -hmm. And that wh whether you're special education or, or at the top of the class, or, you're equal. And equal means you, ha you have your needs and all of those needs should be addressed and should be met. And the teachers in schools should do their best to find whatever is, is best in you and help you develop it. Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's the movement that, that we're a part of to, yes, make reforms. <laughs> And a lot of people love this new book. Um, you got a good review in the Washington Post. That was good to see. Uh, but not everyone does. Uh, you may have seen the New York Times book review this weekend on Sunday. And Annie Murphy Paul wrote, uh, At times slaying Goliath resembles not so much a book as a catalog of Ravitch's vanquished foes. Which which I delighted in as somebody who's been trampled by Goliath for a while in the classroom. Um, but I, have, I just have to ask you, like, who have you enjoyed watching be defeated the most and, uh, in this struggle? Well, I think that um, there were two purposes in writing the book. And, and I think that the New York Times book review, what I objected to the most was she said I was, I only took one side of the argument. I should have taken both sides. <laughs> and I think that's wrong because Rachel Carson did not go and interview DDT manufacturers. <laughs> and I have yet to hear Greta Thunberg talk about the reasons against uh, you know, to be in favor of letting the climate run riot. Right. But you don't have to take both sides of every argument. When you write a book with a point of view, it has a point of view. And she did not appreciate that, so I disagreed with her about that. Uh, but, you know, that's her opinion. So that's mine. Uh, but who have, I, I, I think there are two reasons that I wanted to write this book, and, and they're overriding reasons. One was that I wanted to bring hope and encouragement to people who are in education and say to them, Look, you are actually on the right side of the issues. The, uh, the things that you believe in turn out to be right about, about children, about learning, about cognition. All these things matter. Mm -hmm. And that all these experiments that have been uh, tried on you have failed. And the, uh, there was another message. I wanted to send a message to people like Bill Gates uh, and all those billionaires that I listed you're on the wrong side. Now, the crude way to say it would is, be Is Bill in the house, by the way? <laughs> no? the, okay. the crude way would be to have a big flashing sign that said, loser, <laughs> loser. He, I've discovered that people who are billionaires never want to hear that. But I didn't expect them to, you know, I don't know if they'll read the book or not, but I wanted them to get the message that this is what you should be doing. You should be investing in children, not in testing. You should be investing in improving the lives of families and children and communities so that there's more economic opportunity, so that there are health clinics, so that children don't, don't go homeless, and there are over a million homeless children in America today, and the number is rising. I mean, I know that I thank you all for being here instead of listening to the State of the Union tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we, 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 I'm sure if we were listening, which we're not, we would hear this is the greatest economy ever. Right. But I know that almost half the kids in America live in low-income families. That's right. And how does this happen? 20% of the children in America live in deep poverty. This can't be the greatest economy ever when inequality is so dramatic. And when we have the level of wealth inequality and income inequality that, that we do, uh, this is, that means this is not a just society. And so I would like to see the people who have all of these resources, which are accumulating very, even more every day. I mean, the Waltons, for example, uh, are cumulatively worth $150 billion. Uh, Bill Gates is worth only $110 billion, but there are three Waltons and only one Bill Gates. Um, but the Walton family makes $4 million an hour 24-7. And so I have a suggestion for them. Pay your workers $20 an hour, and you'll do more than all the charter schools you're opening. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> no, so yes. I, I want them to say, this stuff that we've been doing called education reform hasn't worked. And I did see one very promising story, which 
if I could, I would put it in the book. And this was an education week about a, a, a few days ago. And it said that philanthropists are now saying that they're not going to invest in K-12 education because it's not showing results. And they're thinking of investing in education in the arts, education in mental health, education in the school to prison pipeline. And I said, yes, that's the message I want them to get. <laughs> Do right. something useful for a change. Yes, absolutely. Because they're, you're right, like every study that's come out about charter schools and vouchers, over, how many more studies do we need? How many more examples of corruption from charters uh, do we need to have before we say we're going to just invest in the schools that serve all the kids? I wonder if you could talk more about the resistors, you know, and this is the part of the book that just made my heart sing, was seeing people I've been in the trenches with for years getting to be seen on a national level for this work that they're doing. Who, who inspired you in this struggle to stop the privatization of our schools? Well, there, there are many stories, and, and you know, a couple of them I mentioned, uh, but one that I particularly enjoyed was the story of, of what happened in Massachusetts in 2016. And uh, the Waltons have been the lead actors in terms of spreading the gospel of charter schools, and they also fight taxes. So they have all this money and they want lower taxes, which is typical of the kind of the DeVos, uh, Walton way of, libertarian way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Fewer government services that help other people and more, lower taxes for them. And so uh, Walmart is suing in a number of jurisdictions to lower its property taxes, which will mean less money for schools. So they had done, they have spent probably a, more than a billion dollars, a couple of billion dollars on charters. And they decided that they wanted to capture Massachusetts. Now, they already had California because Governor Jerry Brown, who was progressive in almost everything else, uh, loved charter schools. He started two of them himself. So the charter people, there are more charters in California and more charter scandals in California yeah. uh, than any other state. They just had the single biggest scandal in the history of charter schools. The, about a year ago, uh, 11 people were indicted in a $50 million sh uh, scam. Uh, involving an online charter, which is the source of the biggest charter scams, where they get the names of students, collect money for them, and, th and there are no students. Um, so oh, the man. guy who was responsible for that uh, left for Australia and hasn't been rec uh, <laughs> returned as yet. Uh, but so they, they had California. Uh, they had New York, although not entirely, but they had Governor Cuomo, who's a Democrat, but most of his campaign funding came from Wall Street, and the biggest supporters of, of charters, other than the Waltons and Gates and those, that crowd, is Wall Street. Wall Street loves charters. And so Cuomo had gotten $35 million for his last campaign, mostly from Wall Street, and he said that he was the, the charter school champion. So they didn't have to win New York anymore. They were missing the one big blue state, which was Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So they had a strategy plan, and it involved... Uh, having a referendum in Massachusetts. And in the past, all they had to do was threaten a referendum, and the union leadership at that time would simply collapse and say, we'll compromise. And it just so happened that, uh, that in, early in 2016, the Massachusetts Teachers Union got a new leader. Right. Her name is Barbara Mataloni. <clears throat> yes. And Barbara Mataloni, unlike the previous leadership, was totally uncompromising. When the representatives of the Waltons and the charter people came to her and they said, we have three alternatives, one, two, and three. And she said, well, I don't do any of those. Do you have any other ideas? <laughs> no. no. She said, absolutely not. And they, in fact, had a referendum. The Waltons polled in the spring of 2016, and they saw that they would easily win 50 to 60 percent of the vote. They would go forth with the civil rights mes message and say, we need charter schools, more charter schools for poor black and brown children and most people would vote for it. Mm -hmm. Then Barbara Mataloni got her union to assess themselves, and I think she had 110,000 members, and she raised $9 million. And the Waltons and their allies, like Michael Bloomberg and a bunch of other billionaires from out of state, uh, almost, I think they had about two and a half times as much money to spend. But Barbara worked with the union, with teachers, with parents, with local school boards, and by the time November of 2016 came around, they defeated the Walton referendum by 62 to 38%. Yes, yes. It was, 
That's beautiful. And the other thing about that that was wonderful was that the Waltons commissioned a secret analysis of why they lost. And this was printed in one of the journals, and I wrote about it in the book. And they said, it was that Barbara Madaloni, she's a communist. <laughs> <laughs> She's a radical. She even tweeted, real Democrats support public schools. <laughs> Clearly, sedition. Um, I, I hope, you know, it's, I have a couple last questions before we get to some, some conversation with, with everyone here. But, you know, being Black Lives Matter at School Week, I hope you could also talk about the link between charter schools, school choice, and, you know, segregation and, and institutional racism. Well, what we know, not just from what's happening in the U.S., but also internationally, is that choice always increases segregation. Always. It increases, I mean, there are some charter schools that purposely are diverse, and that's great, but inherently choice increases segregation, and many charter leaders say that's just the way it is. So it increases segregation by religion, by race, by socio socioeconomic status. Uh, there was a, uh, a segregation academy in North Carolina called Hobgood Academy that was created uh, specifically for white kids fleeing integration in the 60s. It turned into a charter school so that it <clears throat> the parents no longer had to pay $5,000 a year now Hopgood Academy is all, almost all white. It's like 90% white, uh, and the schools are overwhelmingly black. And now it's a, a free charter school. Uh, throughout the South, the charter schools have become a recreation of a dual black and white school system. Wow. <clears throat> and that's, there have been national studies done by uh, the UCLA Civil Rights Center saying that uh, the charter schools have been a great political success and a, a civil rights failure. Yeah. It wasn't even the language of choice yes. uh, part of that, that resistance to integration during yes. the Civil Rights well, Movement? Well, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when, for many years, people didn't use the word choice because it was so stigmatized as being synonymous with white flight and, and segregation. And yeah. then it got revived. Uh, it got revived really in the early 90s. John Chubb and Terry Moe wrote a book about school choice called uh, Politics, uh, School Choice in America's Schools, in which they said that school choice was a panacea. And the problem with America, American education was democracy. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then you write about, like, the biggest innovation in charter schools. You said in the book, uh, the biggest innovation in the charter sector was the innovation, uh, the invention of no excuses schools, which resurrected early 20th century behaviorist models and strict discipline. Black and brown children, said charter advocates, needed boot camp discipline sternly administrated to learn the values of the white middle class to prepare them to join it. Right. The uh, most successful charter chain in New York City prides itself on no excuses discipline. And that means, and you probably know this already, uh, there's a, a line down the middle of every corridor, and every student has to walk that line, and if they deviate from the line, they get a demerit. Uh, if their shirt tail comes out, they get a demerit. If they speak out of turn, they get a demerit. They must always have their eye on the teacher, or they get a demerit. I mean, it's just, it's so rigid. It's not what, I mean, I, I just can't imagine why <laughs> yeah. any parent would want that. But, um, yeah. you know, th this is the no excuses approach, and it has... It, it seems to attract some parents because they think that they have a promise that their child will be safe. And I have to say, there have been people who've said to me, well, what do you say to the parent who says, I'm desperate to find a better school? And I'll say, you know, you make the choice for your child that you must. But for me, if I'm a policymaker, meaning if I'm the state commissioner of education, if I'm the secretary of education, I don't want to see kids segregated. I don't want to see kids subjected to punitive discipline. I think it's wrong. And I think that you have to think what's best for American society. And what's best for American society is to have a better public school system that meets the needs of all the children in it, rather than it create segregated little corridors and try to run two different school systems, three different school systems. And I think the, one of the evidences of this, although there's more than one, would be Milwaukee. Milwaukee has a voucher sec a sector a charter sector, a, a shrinking pu public sector, and the public sector is overwhelmed with kids with disabilities because the charter sector and the voucher sector doesn't want the kids with disabilities. Right. 
so they have disproportionate numbers in the public schools. All three sectors are doing about the same, and they're all doing terribly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, in Detroit, which does not have vouchers but does have charters, about half the kids are in charters, uh, is uh, the lowest performing city in the country. So if the DeVos formula were correct, Detroit would be at the top, but it's not. It's at the bottom. And it's been very, very harmful, to, particularly to the black kids, because they've been experimented on over the past 20 and 30 years. That's right. And that's exactly why the NAACP came out mm -hmm. opposing charter schools, calling for the moratorium of charter schools. And, and that, that, I think, was one of the bravest things that I've seen in the book in terms mm -hmm. of the resistance. What the NAACP did in 2016 was incredibly powerful, first of all, because it partially took away this claim on the part of the billionaires that they were leading the civil rights movement of our time. Right, right. Which, you know, the day we have a, a civil rights movement led by billionaires, you know, wake <laughs> me up. <laughs> I mean, they're the people you revolt against, not the people who lead the revolt. Um, but the, the NAACP, like other organizations that depend on donations, took a very brave stance because the money would come flowing in from all of these billionaires if they said we endorse charter schools. But they said they held hearings all over the country and the testimony from black parents was very powerful. I remember one in particular who said, uh, it, that I quoted in the book who said there are 13 charter schools within walking distance of where I live. I'm overwhelmed with choices but I don't have a public school. Mm -hmm. And then the New Orleans uh, is their ideal uh, of what charters can do, but New Orleans has no public schools at all. And if that's the future, uh, I don't think we want to go there because know. New Orleans is a highly segregated, highly stratified, failing school system. Half the, 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 the latest ratings came out after my book went to print, but half the schools in the city of New Orleans are failing schools, and they're all black. So this is not a, a, an answer to... Uh, black Lives Matter, to the needs mm -hmm. of black children, That's right. or to the need of our society to have a functioning school system that aims to provide equal educational opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I have one last question. Um, I want to know if you see a through line amongst the, the various resistors you highlight in the book. Like what what kind of activism does it take to really transform our schools, to push back on billionaires? They have all this wealth and power. How do you fight back and win? What are some lessons? And, you know, for me, like, one of the most inspiring examples in the last year was the person who let Betsy DeVos's boat adrift. If you remember that, let it s sail out to sea. But besides that one... She has nine others. She has nine others, so she was okay. Uh, besides, uh, what does it take to win? Um, you know, the, there was a story just the other day that Betsy DeVos and Mike Pence went to Milwaukee to celebrate School Choice Week, but something had happened in Milwaukee. First of all, Scott Walker was no longer governor. And so, and so the governor who replaced him, Tony Evers, who was a former educator, refused to meet with him. Oh, wow. So that was number one. And number two was that the Milwaukee School Board was swept by the Working Families Party. All and right. the Working Families Party would, would very much like to roll back uh, the vouchers, at least, and rain, at least make the charters accountable. Mm -hmm. So I think when you see victories like this, when you see, uh, you know, Jackie Goldberg in Los Angeles and and the effort of Eli Broad to control the Los Angeles school system being frustrated because this one woman won the key vote. And, it, you know, it'll come up for a vote again in 2020, and maybe he'll win next time. But I think that the path to resistance is you've got to get out and vote. You've got to vote these scoundrels out of office. We have to have better people who understand what matters in a democracy. And on this night, at this time, and this year, it seems pretty bleak. Um, but there will be other times, and, and I think that the resistance is aroused, and the purpose of my writing this book uh, in my 81st year is to say, fight on, because look, these guys have won, and you can win too. Mm. Right on. Thank you so much for writing it. And before I forget, maybe you should sign my copy. Okay. <laughs> 
And uh, while she's doing that, if uh, anybody has questions for Diane, we'd love to entertain a few. I'm very glad you're here tonight. <clears throat> I'm a big advocate of teachers' unions. I think they're the most important unions in the country. And when was the real breakdown? When did it occur that teachers' unions lost some of their strength? And what is what can be done to strengthen teachers' unions? And are there advocates now, other than you, who are working hard for the future of teachers' unions? Well, if I understood your question correctly, let me say that I think that one of the keys to restoring our democracy is rebuilding unionism in America. If, if you look at the larger picture, uh, which I alluded to a few times, in, in books like Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, and Jane Mayer's books about dark money, the efforts of these very libertarian uh, reactionaries is to destroy government. And part of destroying government and destroying democracy is, destroy, is destroying unions. And they've done a pretty good job because unions are now down to about 11% of the workforce. And the biggest unions that survive are the teachers' unions. So that makes the teachers' unions prime targets. And, you know, there was the Supreme Court decision, the Janus decision that went against teachers. We may be facing an even more dangerous decision in this current session, uh, the one called Espinosa versus Montana, in which uh, Trump's two zealot, uh, uh, religious zealots on the court may say that uh, states can't prohibit religious schools from getting public funding. And that would take out the uh, prohibitions in 38 state constitutions uh, that say that public money is for public schools and not for religious schools. That would be a, a dramatic uh, earthquake in American education because you'd have every religion claiming part of the public funding. No state legislature that I know of is saying, I'm, we're going to increase the funding because now we're going to fund religious schools. They simply say the pie is this big, and now we'll take this chunk for religious schools and this chunk for charters. So uh, there are still a lot of challenges, and I think right now the, uh, the threat is, um, as I said to Jesse earlier, it's a funny thing about the, the radical libertarians. They don't want any government programs except government funding religious schools. That seems to be the only acceptable one. Yes. Oh, go oh, on this side. Sorry. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the epiphany that you must have had to um, allow you to change your thoughts and positions from when you were involved with the Bush administration. Um, the lessons that might be able to be learned by the likes of Bill Gates, who clearly is an intelligent, educable person, um, that might be able to benefit from how you came around to having a very different point of view. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly, second question, which is um, we resisted charter schools, I think it was twice through statewide um, uh, initiatives. We resisted four, four times. times. Well, then it finally passed. So is there an example of a state that had accepted charter schools that has now decided to go um, the other direction? And if so, what? And uh, if so, how? Okay, so Thank you. you've asked a lot of questions. The first thing... Uh, you could just choose one of them. Okay. My change of mind came over, not an, as an epiphany, but I was involved, after being in the Bush administration, I was in some very high-powered right-wing think tanks. And being on the inside, I would hear people talk about, why would, you know, we believe in charter schools, why are they failing? Why is it that every charter school we open in, such, in, in Ohio is now an academic emergency? And I'd hear these stories about how all the things we were advocating weren't working. Uh, and I remember one of the famous minds at Stanford uh, talked about um, if you got rid of the bottom 10% of teachers every year, you'd eventually have only good teachers. And I thought, I don't think that makes any sense. Where will the new teachers come from? There will always be teachers, not to worry, because, you know, you get rid of the bad teachers based on test scores. And I guess that I just, I had this habit of thinking, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't make sense anymore, particularly as I saw the charter schools flout, at least 
we were saying they were floundering, and yet we were looking for ways to not admit it to the public. And I think that one breaking point was over No Child Left Behind, because I had originally supported it, and then as I watched it change the nature of schools, cause schools to drop the arts, cause schools to drop recess and uh, physical education and other subjects, and I thought this is not the way it should be, because I've always believed in a strong liberal arts education. Um, and one of the think tanks at the Hoover Institution, which is very right wing, uh, I began, I was the dissident and I was disagreeing and we came to a head over no Ch the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. And so the rest of the group, all of whom were like the creme de la creme of conservative intelligentsia, said, well, let's think of ways to mend it. And I said, I don't think it can be mended. I think we should scrap it and do something totally different. And then, so they put out a statement and I was, the, and they would not append my dissent. But so they said, well, what we'll allow you to do is you can have a debate with John Chubb, who at that time was one of the leading advocates of vouchers. And so we had a debate in a right-wing publication called Education Next, and his was called NCLB, Let's Mend It. And then mine was called NCLB, Let's End It. So from right that on. point on, it was very clear that I didn't have a place in that movement anymore. And I was kind of falling away from from everything, uh, and, and you know, the full, it just continued that way. Uh, and your second question was how? About charters. Um, charters. Are there any state? The reason there are charters everywhere is because of Obama and Duncan. Because uh, the race to the top said, here's $4.35 million, billion dollars. And if you want to be eligible for any part of it, you have to increase the number of charters in your state. Many states that never had charters adopted charter legislation to be eligible. So you had 45 states saying we will have charters even if we never had them before so that they could be eligible. Only 18 states won grants. So they were the ones who really jump-started the charter movement. Uh, there are very few states today that don't have charters. Uh, Nebraska is the one that comes to mind. Uh, there are a few states that have a charter. Like Kentucky has a charter law. It's never been funded. And there was just a huge upset in the gubernatorial race in Kentucky uh, where uh, a, an acolyte of Betsy DeVos named Matt Bevins was defeated by a Democrat named Andy Bashir. And the reason he was defeated was because of teachers. The teachers got behind Andy Bashir in this red, red state that elects Mitch McConnell. They elected a Democrat governor of Kentucky, which gives us all hope. Um, but they have a charter law and no charter funding. But there are lots of states, the problem, among many other problems with charters, once the legislature begins to talk about charters or vouchers, they forget, literally forget that 90% of their kids are in public school. And that's all they talk about is should, when will we have more charters, should we have two voucher programs or three voucher programs, and they, that's not where the kids are. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, so over, over here. here. Sorry. Hi. I've been following you since death and life which definitely caused the most blistering argument I've ever had with my mother. Uh, and I was kind of hopeful that the information within that book would at least make her open to some new ideas. And I think you're describing in your previous talk that if somebody's identity is tied up in believing in some mindsets, it's really hard to get any facts through there. And I'm wondering, I think you have access to more people than I do at higher levels than I do, but is there a sense when you are engaging with, say, Congress people and um, other folks that there's an awareness about where the money's going, you know, that they, they pass funding for education, but then giant chunks of it wind up in corporations, whether it's a testing corporation mm -hmm. or a test prep corporation or a computer hardware corporation so we can put all the kids on devices to take the tests, or computer software so the testing platform will talk to the hardware, or utility costs, <laughs> right. or everybody who works in IT that has to make all the devices work. I mean, like, there's just an obscene amount of money that is earmarked for education but is being transferred directly out of school districts and going in these bank accounts. Do the people who are passing this money get it? No. Okay. No. And, you know, a, a lot of the technology uh, that's adopted is quickly obsolete or never used. Um, and I know that with what happened in, in Iowa yesterday, it's been interesting. 
uh, to listen to people say they should have never switched over to that app and uh, would be better off if uh, they were hand counting. And I have to, just as an aside, mention that 20 years ago, it, when we had the, the disaster in this country with the Bush versus Gore election, I served on a federal election commission chaired by Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. And so one of the questions we looked at was, is there a technology that is better for counting votes than hanging chads and whatever they were doing in Florida? And it turned out that the, the best technology, the most foolproof, was the one that was being used in New York State, where a person went into a booth, pulled a lever, so the, the curtain closed behind them, they registered their vote, and then they, when they pulled the lever that way, their vote registered. And they said, but that's obsolete, so we're not going to use that anymore. And, but we have all this touch screen, and then the question came up, can these uh, touch screens be hacked? And the answer was yes. And there was something called, I think it was called a hackathon in Las Vegas, where they brought together every voting machine now in use and said to a bunch of hackers, can you hack this machine? And every single voting machine was hacked. So sometimes progress takes us in horrible directions, and I think this is one of them, where we're, uh, we're wasting a lot of money uh, putting kids in front of screens, and the, what the effort is, in my view, is to replace teachers with uh, machines. And it's, it's uh, called personalized learning, but in my book I refer to it as depersonalized learning, because personalized learning must involve contact between human human beings, not between a person, not between a child and a screen. That's right. And I think all of this is going to be uh, looked upon as, you know, that poor kids get computers and rich kids get teachers. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So we, we have a few more minutes. Um, and if people could uh, also just introduce yourself, and thankfully we have the great Becca Ritchie here, um, so I can help with that introduction, but if, if other people can introduce yourselves before you speak. So I'm Becca Ritchie, and I'm the chair of the Washington Education Association Badass Teachers Caucus. Yeah. Um, I saw you 10 years ago here. I saw you uh, at UW a couple years ago, and we've been in this fight together for a long time. I marched in 2011 with you. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing, and I'm not at the end of my career yet, but I'm 30 years in, is that our new teachers were raised in No Child Left Behind, and they're used to the testing. And when I push back, people look at me like, why would you do that? So um, I think that's one thing about talking about the history. How do we get that word out? The other thing I wanted to mention is Washington State did rolling walkouts for over a month to get our funding. We're one of the strongest teachers unions in this state. And every, all of these, the Red for Ed, we've been doing that since our first new business item for that was 2012. So that movement, it's been going, and it was inspired by the teachers in Chicago. Um, so I think that, I think making sure that, that we recognize that hard work, because that wasn't easy for people to walk out, but they took strike votes. And we were in the news constantly for a month. Um, and I think over half of our membership walked. So that's, that's a, that was a big, we set that record for other people to see that it's able to be done. And then we got some of the biggest raises in the country because our union is so strong. But the young teachers is a question. Yeah, right. okay. Thank you. Okay, two, two part question. One is I worry about the younger teachers, first of all, because many people, because ed schools have seen a dramatic decline. And people don't want to be teachers because they see how disrespectfully teachers have been treated. So I think that one of the things that will build respect for teachers is teachers taking strong action for themselves and getting the respect that they deserve by acting. No one's going to give you respect. You have to, you have to work for it, which you did. And I think you may have been inspired by one of the heroes in my book, Karen Lewis of Chicago. That's right. And yeah. she's great. And Barbara. And, uh, you know, you guys did an incredible job here. But I think that the only way the young people are going to want to come into teaching when, is when they see that teachers are strong and they're well paid and they're professional. And I think that in your own head, you've got to remember 
Teaching to the test is unethical. And it, you, you've got to somehow get the ed school people together and yourselves together and the young people as they come in are looking to the senior teachers and say, we do this because we have to, but this is not teaching. Yes. Because what matters is what's in your head and what's in your heart. And what's in your head and your heart is how do I awaken the love of learning? And this testing is not going to do it. That's right. Thank you. Hi. I'm sorry to say this is going to be our final question. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everybody. But Diane will be signing in the north lobby if you want to ask her anything there. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, my name is Kurt. Uh, principal and founder of a Choice Public School, and um, a few uh, weeks ago I was meeting with um, the directors of a new charter school that's opening up in Highline, just in the Highline area uh, next year, and they were both super idealistic, they're both public school teachers from, from Seattle, West Seattle, actually high school, and where they're coming from is just their frustrations with public school, of you know, this endless testing, this common core, this... Um, you know, the, the emphasis on data, the phony emphasis on data, and this whole standards-based movement where they just feel they just can't make any more, you know, they're just fed up with, with want, they want to make a difference, they, they're passionate, they care about kids. How do teachers, people like that, do it in the public school system when they're hit with so many barriers of this one-size-fits-all, data-driven world we now live in? Because they're doing it through charters, and I know that I understand the critique of them, but man, they were idealistic, they care about kids, and they seem to be great educators. Well, you know, there are many people who go to charters with the hope that they can break free of that, but charters are subject to the same requirements as, as regular public schools are. And unfortunately, the charter movement is, um, a, lot, a lot of it is funded by people who, don't, who are not idealistic, who are looking to make money. I just read today that and he, Andre Agassi, whom you recall as a great tennis player, he started his own charter school in Las Vegas, and he uh, was everyone was going to be ready for college and so forth. But his his charter school was a failure, had a lot of turnover of teachers and principals, and he it finally landed up being as the lowest performing school in all of Nevada. So he turned it over to another charter. He's now gone into the charter building business, and he just built a charter school and sold it in Florida for sixty one million dollars. He realized he was in the wrong end of the charter business. But, you know, there are a lot of people who see charters as a way to make money, um, mostly from the real estate. And I understand you're talking about the yeah. idealistic kids. Those idealistic kids are going to be subject to the same yeah. pressure. But how do, pub how do public school employees then make a difference in the public school system? I mean, right now there's all the, I mean, there's a really, I mean, this whole, the where we're at in public education now, this one-size-fit-all model, this incessant thing on data, you know, this um, this belief in the standards base where everything just becomes this little checklist of what kids need. I mean, how do these idealistic people make a difference in public education? How do they fight from within that? Well, you know, we used to have something called uh, alternative schools. Uh, in New York State has something called uh, the New York Performance-Based Performance right. Standards Consortium. And they have gotten exemption from all of this. Uh, they only take one test, which is the Regents' graduation exam, uh, but they're exempted from all of the other tests. That's and right. they do everything by performance. They have uh, students create their own projects. They're judged by uh, people that, that, that the school chooses or the kids choose and their parents and teachers. And they have, ex have they're about 38 schools. There should be 538 of them. But they're, you have to find that um, the whole, you know, as Leonard Cohen says, the hole where the light gets in and expand it and say to the state legislature, give us an opportunity to show that we can do better without the standardized test. And you have to create the opportunity uh, because they're not going to give it to you. Um, one of the dreams that I've had would be to ask state legislators uh, to take the test they mandate <laughs> right. and publish their scores. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quickly. And what, I have to mention that one of the heroes in the book is a group called, um, they're in Texas, and they're mothers, and they, they, their name, official name, is um, Texans Advocating for Meaningful Student Assessment. 
No one could remember that name, Texans advocating for meaningful student assessment, so they're called Moms Against Drunk Testing. <laughs> and they, they got together because the legislature wanted to increase the five tests required for high school graduation to 15. And so they stopped the 15 because they just pers they persisted you, day after day going to the legislature, uh, putting their hands on the shoulder of uh, you know every legislator, and they realized this was a bipartisan issue. People were sick of the testing, and I think that's what has to happen: is the people's revolt. And the problem, the biggest problem right now, is that the mandate is not coming from your state capital; uh, it's coming from Washington. And there are very few people in Washington who give more than five minutes of thought to education. They, they, they drink the toxic fumes of, uh, they inhale the toxic fumes of No Child Left Behind, and they can't think beyond uh, standardization and mandated testing. So I think there has to be a popular uprising, and I can't think of a better place for it to start than the state of Washington. You have a wonderful history. Absolutely. And Thank as you. one of those teachers who refused to give the MAP test, we showed that it can be done, right? And we're building the Black Lives Matter at school movement that is transforming public education as well. It can be done with it. I mean, look at LeBron James decided instead of to build a charter school for innovation, the innovative method we go, we meet with the, with the public schools and we provide wraparound services for, for those youth, right? So, um, my mom is here, and my mom helped start an alternative school here in Seattle that I went to middle school at, right? And, and in those schools, we didn't have grades, right? And so you can do all kinds of innovation within the public schools that serve everybody instead of segregating off the few. And, and I thank you for, for leading the charge in this and helping to tell the stories of people who have been in the trenches for years. It's just, I hope everyone will read this and then go out and find a public school to help defend. So thanks Thank for coming you. tonight, Diane. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.